Nick, got my, my, my brother, my, my former teammate, Nick Canamelli, joining Go Turpins with Travis Garrison on the Build of Six Eight Networks. What's going on, bro, man? How's everything? Everything's great, man. It's good to see you. I've been looking forward to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nah, man. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I know uh, I appreciate you taking time out your schedule. I know you over in Spain, right? France. France? Yeah, it's living life, Bouncing man. Around, man. Bouncing around. <laughs> yeah, you're over in France right now, man. I see the lovely family, man. How's, how's everybody doing? How's the family? Everybody's great. Uh, we are in uh, the south of France, in Marseille. Um, and I'm here with my wife and my daughter. She's 15 months, Jade. Um, and we've been, it's basically kind of lockdown, semi lockdown. You can go outside, but the only thing open is like grocery stores. So we've just been laying low, man. Just, uh, you know, gym home type of routine and spending time with Jade and, and wifey. So it's been cool, man. It's been, it's been a good year. Man, that's what's up, man. You said the South of France, man. I was like, <laughs> so you said the South of France, bro. I already know. I already can imagine how that is, man, and how beautiful it is, man. Then, like, you've been over there with your family. I'm like, you know, you know, I mean, that, there it is right there. You got everything right there, man. The wifey, the little one. Exactly. Exactly. It's been cool, man. I mean, obviously, hopefully, before I get out of here, things open up a little bit. Um, but like you just laid out, man, there's nothing to complain about. Everybody's healthy, so. Season's going good. My body feels pretty good. Um, so it's all good, man. Hey, hey, you're keeping it going for us, man. You know, you know, uh, the, the, the fearsome foursome, bro. You're keeping it go going for us, bro. So, yeah, <laughs> man. I'll be 38 in October. This is year number 15. So, um, you know, I'm still enjoying it. And, and obviously the biggest factor is, is health. You know, that's something I control. I try to control what I can control, which is, um, you know, just taking care of my body and, and diet stuff that is, is really necessary at this stage. But other than that, it's just the basketball gods keeping me healthy. And as long as I can play, I'm going to play, man. I'm definitely going to keep on going. Um, I still love it. And, uh, you know, I understand that I have the rest of my love, life to do anything else. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this as long as I can. Yeah, absolutely, man. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely, like I said, man, I keep up with all you guys, man, and just see you, see you out of our group, man, still playing, bro. Um, you know, sometimes I miss it. I miss the, the whole plan part, but then my body reminds me like, man, not really. <laughs> <Yeah. Okay. laughs> you know, but, but, but mostly the, the traveling part, man, seeing other, other countries and the culture, man. Now you get to have your family with you to take with you over there, man. So it's, it's definitely a beautiful thing, bro. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, uh, have you been keeping up with the turf this year, this past season? I have as much as possible. The, time difference makes it tough to watch the games. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even in the tournament, I wasn't able to watch the game. Uh, it's six hours later here. Um, but I, I followed, you know, and, and was rooting for them and, and had them in my bracket for sure. You know, I always do a, a attorney bracket, which my bracket was a disaster, but uh, I always ride with the Terps, man. And it looks like they had a, a really good year. And I just can't imagine being a, a college athlete uh, during all this stuff going on with COVID. So, you know, hats off to them for, for having a successful season under the circumstances. And, um, you know, it looks like they got a good program and good staff over there. I haven't really got a chance to talk to Coach Turgeon much, but I've heard great things about him. Um, so, you know, I've been following from afar for sure. Yeah, definitely, man. And, um, you know, the people that, the individuals that I did talk to about you know, playing in the COVID situation, man, you know, first they didn't, first last year they had a chance to go far and then COVID happened to shut down the season. So you can only imagine, bro, we, we get on our run and then they shut the whole season down and now we can't even get in the tournament. And then the following season, you don't even know if you're going to have a season, then playing with no fans and you know how we, we was playing, you know, how our fans helped us out a lot. When we were playing, especially those big games, man. That's one of the best parts of the experience, you know, the, the fans and the environment and to not have that I, again, it's, I can't imagine, I can't imagine, man. It, it's, it's tough. This, this whole COVID experience has hit everything, you know, and for athletes, you know, I just, I'm, I'm sympathetic towards, towards that part. And then the lifestyle too, of, of being a, a college student and that whole experience, which was, a great part of it as well. Um, you know, I'm sure on campus things are looking a lot different, right? You know, 
um, which probably has its pros and cons too. You know what I mean? Those, those guys don't have much distractions, but um, you know, I, I would definitely, I would definitely, you know, not want to be in that situation as a college student athlete. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I'm pretty sure it's kind of not similar, but a little similar over there with you all, man. I don't, do you do you all have fans at the games? No, in France, it, it's been a mess. Like when I first got here in the middle of August. Mm. things were open. They were carrying it like COVID's all good. You know, we got past. And, and at that point, the narrative was United States dropped the ball. Europe did it the right way because they locked down like really strict lockdown. Right. But then as things have come full circle, now Europe is because they opened back up and because they were living life relatively normal um, in September, October, they just had a spike and then locked things down. So I've been on lockdown since like October for six months now. Um, and like I'd mentioned, no fans, but nothing open with the exception of grocery stores and essential, nothing open. You know what I mean? No restaurants, just take out, which we experienced in the States, you yeah. know, but I experienced it in the States. And then as soon as I got over here, so I've basically been on lockdown for a year. When I got back from Japan, it was Japan that started in January. It started earlier. So I left Japan because of COVID, thinking I'm getting away from it. Right. As soon as I get back to the States in late February, it hits the state, locked down for majority of the summer, and then get over. It, things just had started to kind of open up a little bit uh -huh. uh, when I left in early August, but then get over here, and I'm thinking, oh, this is nice. Things are open, and then boom, everything's shut down. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's similar with the no fans, and it's a different vibe without fans for sure. Yeah, man. <clears throat> like I said, good thing you, you got your family over there, man. You're not going crazy, you know, because you're by yourself. So I know that, like I said, I know yeah. that. Man. Yeah, I'm not going crazy. Wifey, is, it's not easy when you don't have family to help. I mean, you're a dad, right. you know, and, and, you know, she's here with a one year. And I'm obviously traveling and, and you know, sometimes two a days. Um, and she's here with a one year old right. um, with no outlets. Nowhere right. to take her, right. nobody to come over and help for a date night. No, you know what I mean. So it, it's been that process. Of, that part of it has been has been tough, you know, for her. And then obviously for me, seeing her because she she she's somebody who has sacrificed a lot from her career to be over here. At you know, she's she's somebody who likes to be active and likes right. to be doing things and 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 following her passions. So that alone is tough. But then to be over here on lockdown without you know with a one-year-old so that takes away a lot of your identity for a certain to, to a certain extent with how much time you have to dedicate to the kids so that part has been challenging for sure um you know but we're we're taking it a day at a time and we're figuring it out and, and it's been cool man as you know being a dad is the best thing in the world yeah. you know um and, and now i got her you know she i i think she's gonna love basketball of course you know, as, as a basketball player, I would say that. And I don't think I'm being biased. Like, she's just – I took her to the gym today, and she's chasing the ball, saying ball, yeah. all this stuff. So I just can't wait, man. I, I just look forward to every single part of it. And, you know, as every dad tells me and mom tells me, it goes by so quick. So yeah. that's been one of the silver linings about everything being slowed down right now with COVID because I've been – so present and I've been, you know, with her more than I ever would be with just being at home and not being all over the place. Um, you know, so that part of it is, has been cool for sure. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely, man. It, de it definitely goes by super fast. Every time I see my daughter, man, it just seems like she's getting taught. All my kids just seem to be getting taught and more mature. It goes super fast. I had my, um, I went to a basketball practice yesterday and I took her, she wanted to go with me and I slowly been kind of, Seeing if she liked the game of basketball and things like that. And um, she's starting to really get into it. Like she's super competitive anyway, you know. But yesterday we was at the court. She was like, she was like itching to get out there. I want to basketball, I want to dribble. Like she just, so I'm like, all right. So now that I'm starting to see that, I kind of, you know, push her a little bit more, yeah. you know. The yeah, man. So, you know, none of, my, none, of my boys, yeah, none of my boys play basketball. So she's like the more athlete of the family. So it's, I'm yeah. curious to see how she's going to respond to that, man. Yeah. But, uh. But uh, yeah, man. So let's let's talk about a little bit about uh Maryland, man. So obviously coming out of coming out of high school, man, big deal. You know, main player of the year. Uh, pretty sure you had a ton of offers. What made you choose the University of Maryland? 
And what other? And if you didn't go to Maryland, where would he? Where would have you have gone to? Um, yeah, coming out of Maine, I don't know if I would have considered myself a big deal. I appreciate that. You know what I mean? I was, you know, coming from Maine, there wasn't a lot of guys who had played it at big schools. Um, and I didn't really get recruited from Maine. I was, I, my dad's from LA. So I played on an AU team in LA. Um, and that's where I was first seen by Jimmy Patsos. Um, and you know, my mom's a high school guidance counselor. So that was a big benefit for me because what she does for a big part of her job is helping kids transition from high school to college and and deciding where to go and why they want to go there. So one of the things my mom told me is when you go on campus, you, you know, you'll have this feeling like, I feel like this is home. This, this, you can't really quantify it, but you just have that feeling, you know, and I visited Missouri North Carolina, Yukon, and I then visited Maryland. Um, and it was a combination of things. One, being on the East Coast um, and being in a big market, uh, you know, I, I was excited about that. And then I actually committed before Maryland won the national championship. Um, but they obviously had a great program at that point with the similar guys in that team. They'd been playing well. So they were, you know, a perennial top 10 at that point, top 15. So it's a big, big school. And I loved Jimmy and, and coach Dickerson and Gary, Gary came up to Maine and I took him out for some lobster. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I just felt comfortable, you know what I mean? And, uh, went down for my visit and, and was with Steve Blake, um, and drew and those guys. And, you know, those guys made me feel really comfortable and then it was an easy decision. You know, it was just like my, my mom had said, it was that gut feeling like I felt like it was home and, and it took me no time at all to make a decision once I went down there. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, yeah, de- definitely. I think when I went on my visit, man, it was, uh, I was with Chris Wilcox. So that yeah. was, yeah, it was pretty cool, man. Um, so, so you choose Merlin, but if you, had, if you didn't go to Merlin, what was your other, your second option, your second choice? It's interesting because at that time, my second choice would have been Missouri. And it really wasn't uh, in comparison to North Carolina, Virginia, you know, some of the other schools that I was looking at, um, Kansas, UConn. It wasn't obviously the biggest name, but I loved Quinn Snyder. And he was the sole reason why I was so interested in, in Missouri was him. You know, he was one of the first people that recruited me. Um, and his personality and, and, and talk about feeling comfortable, you know, when I went to my visit there, like he really made me feel appreciated. He really knew my game. It wasn't just like the, the pitch, you know, um, it was really personalized to me and my game. And I felt like in comparison to some other places, I was going to be able to have an impact immediately as a freshman. I didn't know what it was going to look like at Maryland. I knew um, you know, there'd be some opportunity to play at the three with Mouton leaving. Um, so, but with Missouri, it was going to be like a real big role right away. Um, so that would have been it. And, and, you know, I'm not surprised to see all the success that Quinn Snyder's had right. as a coach, man, because he's, I, I mean, he was a special dude and, uh, you know, I've stayed in touch with him a little bit and he's, he's a, he's a great guy. And, and that would have been number two for me for sure. Okay. <clears throat> so now, okay. So now the transition from living in Maine, now you at Merlin, your first year, what was that transition like for you um, that summer? And then obviously that first year, you know, coming in obviously from high school and then going on to play at the college level after they, especially after they won the national championship, what was that process like? Yeah, man. I mean, <clears throat> the biggest thing, the biggest adjustment for me um, was adjusting to the fact that, understanding what our, I don't even know how to articulate it, like what we were on the campus, you know what I mean? And the fact that we had people watching everything we were doing, that and that part of it, um, like that kind of celebrity of it was really new to me because in Maine, if you play basketball, nobody cared, you know what I mean? It was like, all right, cool. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. So I would be able to go to parties and be able to do, and, and I would just be one of the fellas. I would just be one of the other guys, you know? 
And as soon as I get to Maryland, I came in probably with that energy a little bit too much. Like, um, you know, I was just being myself and which is fine, but you also have to learn at a young age, right at 18 years old, coming out of high school, that you need to carry yourself sort of as an adult to a certain extent. Like you have to, you're representing a university, a program, there's a lot of history and you can't just be one of the fellas. You can't just be one of the guys at the party. You know, you, you have a lot more to lose and you have a lot more eyes on you. And so that was an adjustment for me. And it was an adjustment for me throughout all of college. You know, it, it's an adjustment. You're a young guy and, um, you know, just finding, you know, your, your, your rhythm with how to carry yourself was, was something that was a process for me. Um, and I do think part of it was because I was from a small town, but I think that part of it is just the reality of being young in that environment. You know, where all of a sudden you go from a small area to a place where, you know, you're walking around campus and everybody knows who you are and you go, you go to restaurants, you go to a bar, everybody knows who you are. And that, that whole thing was, was an adjustment for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> like I said, I can imagine, man, like you said, coming from Maine and then coming to the East Coast. I mean, then back then, man, D.C., that area was, it was live. And even on campus, man, yeah. it, was, it was crazy. Like I said, you just won a national championship and they still was riding high off that. So we kind of, we kind of got that, that same energy, you know what I mean? As if we yeah, were yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, we so, went right into that for sure. Right, man, you, you, we thought we wanted, for, <laughs> we thought we wanted yeah. to, we just they had a ring to, to show it. <laughs> um, so, so all right, now, like I said, you come from Maine. Now, in regards to the basketball world, in regards to the basketball, um, what was that transition like? You know, like you said, you know, playing, getting a lot of minutes in high school, but then you come to college, you don't really know how, many, how much time you want to get or what the situation is because of the players that's coming back from the national championship team. So what was that adjustment like and that whole process uh, of adjusting to the time and then to the role that you had to play? Yeah, in retrospect, a lot of it came down to the the people in the organization and my teammates made it a lot easier for me. You know, when I think back on it now, at that time, I was a little bit, even on the court, I was a little bit ignorant to how big it was of what it was we were doing. You know, I didn't, I, I was kind of like blind to the fact that we were playing in front of millions of people. You know, like I was in the moment and I was, it was basketball to me, so um, that part of it was, if I was to do it now, I think it would, I'd probably have more nerves. It's crazy to say, like, even after playing as a pro, I'd probably have more nerves now than I did then. At that, I look back, I was 18 come, and I remember playing in my first game and I was relatively comfortable. I didn't, I wasn't super nervous, but a lot of it was because of the leaders on the team, like Steve Blake, Drew Nicholas, and a big one for me was Calvin McCall. So like talking about playing minutes. So I came in and he was a returning senior. And, and you know how it is when you come into a team, everybody know who's the point guard, who's the two. Steve Blake's a starting one. Nobody's questioning that. And if you did, you were catching a jab. Everybody's seen that on YouTube with JG. <laughs> and then, and then uh, with, <laughs> with, with Drew Nicholas, you had him at the two. But then it was like Calvin McCall at the three who played football. And he was kind of the starter because he was a senior. And then, you know, the four and the five, um, relatively similar with, with Ryan Randall. You know, he was a guy who, who you know, been on the national championship team. Um, and so you knew he was going to play minutes. And Taj Holden, um, you know. So I think that with, throughout that process, Calvin made me feel really comfortable in that position because he didn't look at it like, you're taking my minutes. He, he carried it like, I'm going to, be a mentor to you of what you need to do to be a, a, to be a, a, a impact player and to be able to play a role on this team. Like he was unbelievable. I mean, that whole experience, I still carry some of the things that he did as a mentor and as a leader on with me throughout my whole career now of how to be with younger guys and how important it is to make them feel comfortable. Right. Um, Cause it's important to challenge young guys, but also making them feel comfortable is important too. I, I feel like, and Blake did a great job. And then you had guys like Dave and Jimmy and Matt, the assistants, who Gary was intimidating. Mm -hmm. for, I mean, there's no getting around it because he demanded respect and he was an incredible, you know, national championship coach and 
played at Maryland and, and, and was a, a big time coach. So he was intimidating coming in as a freshman. I mean, to be fair, he was intimidating to me all the way until the day I left. Even now, like I have so much respect for coach Williams right. that I don't think intimidated is the right word, but it's, you have so much respect to it's where it's almost intimidated, which I feel like is the max respect, right. you know? And uh, so those guys did a really good job of, of translating, you know, some of Coach Williams' messages and helping, you know, behind the scenes with feeling comfortable on and off the court. So the transition for me, a big part of it was the leadership of some of those veteran guys and then the coaching staff made it a lot easier. And then having young guys with me, like you and, and JG and, and Chris, and how we all went through that together, having the relationship, because we had such a close relationship from when we first came in. Right. And... Uh, I think that part, when you had other guys that you could lean on and we're all going through the same thing, um, you know, I think that that was a big part of it as well with being comfortable and, you know, getting to the point where we won an ACC championship as sophomores was part of, I think, you know, feeling comfortable right away and then the relationship that we had. Right. right. And, 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 you, and you made a good point, man. <clears throat> Cause I look back on it a lot myself, especially when I talk to the younger players or any other players in regards to, I mean, we 18 years old, you know what I mean? We, we coming in on campus, we don't know the, I know for myself, um, I didn't understand or comprehend the positions that we were in and what we were walking into. Like you said, we walking right. on campus, like it's just another day, you know, we're going to go up here and practice, we're going to hoop. Whereas, like you said, we don't understand that there's going to be millions of people watching, that the fan is crazy, you know, that uh, people demand more from us or, the expectations that they had, like I know for myself, man, I was, I didn't, I wouldn't, I didn't understand it. None of that, like nothing, like yeah, nothing. You know what I mean? It was just like I said, I was just going on campus and just, I was being like you said, man. I was, I was the same way. You know, I always looked at myself as just one of the guys. So yeah, I, I can go out, I can go have fun, I can go party, I can go to bars, and nobody ain't gonna yeah. know why. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm hanging out with friends and we just having a good time. Whereas. Whereas that's, that's not the case, you know, that's, that's not the case um, that, like you said, looking back on it now, we understand how big we were, but we understand at the time, which I know for me kind of put me in situations, you know what I mean? But um, for sure. like, like you said, we live and learn, we, we learn from that stuff. And now we use those things, like you said, to talk to the younger players, to talk to our teammates. Now we kind of, we, we had the mentors, you had Calvin, Calvin used to, Talk to me a lot too. You know, he used to say certain things. He was real cool with it, put us to the side, or we walk into the room or go to his room and we had those conversations, you know, or Ryan Randall, or Taj and Steve, all those guys. They did a great job in regards to um, bringing us in and, and, and kind of mentoring us in a sense, you know, kind of making it, forcing us to get on their level. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, absolutely. They demanded so much because they just won a national championship and they fought, yeah. they, they actually fought their way to that position and they, they deserve the respect, like you said, and especially with coach Williams, you know? So um, that's something that, like you said, looking back on it now, I didn't understand at the time, but I use it now to help other young players and other individuals and other uh, players and other student athletes. You know what I mean? Yeah. What was the, so at Maryland, what was, what was some of the, we won't go through a couple of things, man. Cause I was there with you, bro. <laughs> we, yeah, what was some, you, man. Hey, hey, so what was what was um what was some of your your most your best moments on and off the court? Like what was some of the things I already kind of know which one you're gonna say in regards to on the court, but like what was some of your 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 best moments? Like, man, this is one of my best moments. Like I always talk about this. I thought you were gonna say you already know what I was gonna say my best moments off the court. I thought <laughs> that's what you were gonna leave with. Uh nah. But on the court, I, I remember a few that pop out immediately for me. One, when we went down to Florida, you hit that big shot, and uh, we beat Florida when they were number one in the nation. And that was – I remember that. Obviously, the ACC tourney run as sophomores, winning in Duke when we were juniors, when they were number one. I think to, to, to beat a number one team and then to do it on their court, those are, those are, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's all, all that much more sweet when you do it on, on their court. Um, and then those are the ones that really stand out. Um, you know, those are the ones that when I think back on 
you know, on the court, those, those were the, the biggest, biggest events for us. And then off the court, um, you know, off the court, what I remember now are the lessons that I learned, you know, some of the things that weren't necessarily positive experiences. Uh, so those are the ones that I think about the most. The funnest times I had were, were, were you know, us living together, that process, you know, being able to, to have, we had a, uh, four of us staying in, in the same spot, me, you, John, uh, and, and Chris. And I think we had, did Dre, Dre live with us, right? Andre Dre, 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 Andre Collins and Jamar Smith. And Jamar Smith. Yeah. And just that, you know what I mean? There's so many good times we had that I can't necessarily think of one, but it wasn't anything really going out. It was always the stuff that we were doing, you know, at the spot or, the interactions we had, the stuff that we were doing, we were hanging out. The freestyle. Um, those were, yeah, man. You know <laughs> what I mean? Uh, it's funny because there was a podcast with, uh, with JJ Reddick and Dame Lillard was on it. And, sure. and Dame had asked him, like, did you play when, when Nick Cantor Medley was at? Uh, and they've been talking a little bit about rap because Dame obviously is uh -huh. so talented. And, and Dame was like, oh, he's nice, man. He's nice. And JJ's like, he raps? And, and Dame, <laughs> And Dame was like, nah, nah. And I was just about to reach out to those dudes and be like, hold up, hold up. But no, I mean, all that stuff, man, we did that was, you know, those experiences are what I, I remember the most, man. Those were the best experiences off the court. But there was there was ones to, to your point, and I, and I followed the stuff that you're doing off the court now and think first. That mantra in and of itself is such a great lesson for young people because you hear it. I heard it to a certain extent, but not simplified and so direct uh, from older guys when I was young. But that's really what it comes down to. You know, you think of some of the decisions that I made and we all made at that age. If we just taken a little bit more time to think about what we were doing and, the, and then the, comp the consequences and repercussions, you know, probably would have gone a long way. But, you know, those experiences prepared me to be a pro. Absolutely. And I would have rather had, thank God there wasn't, social media like it is now when we were in college good lord you know i i whew, that would have been that would have that would have had potential to be damaging moving forward <laughs> but uh joking aside man like uh you know it was it was lessons that prepared me to be a pro you know and when i went overseas you know it prepared me for after having four years at, at school and being in that, in that environment you know i i already understood you know, certain responsibilities that I didn't, I, I didn't understand. And that's why I think that that the college process for student athletes is so important. I mean, obviously there's the talent and, and, and you see a lot of guys going the, the G league and now some guys are going to Europe first as opposed to going to college. But I think that if I was an NBA team and an executive, I think that I would value guys that have had, a, had a couple of that, those learning curves. And I guess, and I'm sure the G League is going to do a great job of, but you can teach somebody something, but real life experience is different than, than hearing about it. Sitting in a lecture hall and having somebody tell you, hey, man, you got to think about this and they're going to do that. But to actually be in the mix is a whole different set of experiences because a lot of times the ones that make you better and prepare you to really actually have that responsibility are the ones that you make mistakes, the setbacks, because you really feel it. You right. really understand mm -hmm wow, this, this sucks. I don't right. want to have to deal with this again. I mean, I got arrested in college. You know what I mean? That wasn't a secret. Right. You know, then there's headlines of me saying wild stuff, right. you know, that I never really said to be fair, but that's part of it, right? I mean, you, you're never going to get the fair shake of what did you really say when you were drunk in the middle of a party and, you know, in an altercation, like nobody cares what you really said. You shouldn't have right. been drunk at 20, you know, well, drunk at 20 is, you know, you know, whatever it's part of right. learning, but you shouldn't have been in an altercation. It doesn't matter what you said. You know what I mean? So those experiences made me better and, and taught me what I needed to know to be a pro, for sure. And um, you made some great points, man. Um, and I remember that Duke game, too, bro. You was killing that game, too, bro. He was good. I think we all, we all tend to remember some of the games you played good. I didn't mention any games, but I played <laughs> like shit. <laughs> hey, bro, that game right there, that game was special, bro. That, you, you was, you was, you was on, you, you was, you was, it was crazy. I remember that game. Um, and obviously the, the ACC run, I mean, that's, that's like one of the moments I always bring up 
24-7 when it comes to the uh, college experience. I think we could have, and like you saying, going back to the whole, the think first and, and you know, make a wiser choices. I mean, like you said, we coming in with, with young teens. We don't know nothing. We don't know nothing about nothing. We just want to have a good time. We, we kind of like the, the big deal on campus. Um, we kind yeah. of, you know, um, everybody knows who we are. Um, and we don't understand, like, if I think, I know for myself, speaking for myself, if I'd have had the mentality like a, a Steve Blake and a Drew and those guys in regards to the 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 um dedication to the game, I think we would have, I know for myself speaking, if I would have been more focused and you know, dedicated myself more to the game than to these clubs and parties and stuff, man, I probably could have helped the team a lot more than I did. You know what I mean? So I always think back on those things, you know, like you said, we have the good moments, but the, the experiences, the, the things that we've been through, um, the troubles that we've been through, it always kind of like it, it molds us a, se- a certain way, you know, kind of help us uh, going on in life and, you know, learning the lessons. You know, if you don't go through anything, how can you really build and grow? You know what I mean? Exactly. So, and, and I think that uh, that helped us get to where we are now. You know, you wouldn't Absolutely, be. Absolutely, no probably, doubt. You probably wouldn't have had that mindset now if you didn't go through some of the things that you've been through. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, I mean, I appreciate the, the damn. I wish I would have, I wish I would have been, I wish I would have helped more than I did back then. You know, that's kind of one of the things I was like, ah, you know, but it is what it is now. Um, but like you said, man, it's, 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 it's kids, man. They don't understand. And like you said, thank God we have social media, bro. I tell people all the, I tell people all the, every time I do an interview or anything, I say, man, the thing that saved me for sure and, and, and saved us, man, is the social, Facebook and Instagram and, all these things these kids have now, man, like, man, bro. It changed everything because find me a, find me a, a, a not even a college athlete, right? But a, just a guy or a girl in college. Mm. And they would have had the same reaction. You know, man, if things were, if I was on a, you know, Instagram live or if somebody was videotaping me when I was 19 years old in the middle of, you know, with freedom on a college campus in a big city, right. find me somebody who, wouldn't have wanted people to see some of that. And I'll find you somebody who live in a pretty sheltered lifestyle, you know what I mean? And probably making good decisions, no disrespect to people that may not be in those situations. But reality is there's a lot of people, you know, coming up in our generation that wouldn't have wanted social media when they're in college sometimes, you know what I mean? Like that doesn't mean that you were out of control per se. It just means that, you know, even to this day, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's wild how much, you know, there's no privacy for young people and, and people are getting judged by what they're doing at 19 years old. Mm-hmm. And it's changed the process for young players now, like as a coach and as a mentor, like you are, and what I've tried to do in Maine, when I talk to young players through a nonprofit that I have is exactly that. Not only do you have this responsibility at the next level, whatever that is for you, but now you have this entire different aspect of visibility and exposure that can mm-hmm. can be used to your benefit in in some ways but also if, if you're not you know if you're not aware of it um it can be a negative for you so it's it's it's, it's challenging man like these young these young up-and-coming student athletes you know it, it it's there's a lot on their plate you know with with that stuff you know what i mean and um you know, I think the first guy who really got aired out with that stuff was Johnny Manziel. And mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff that Johnny Manziel was doing was what 90% of college people, you know, we don't even have to separate athletes. Like, just because you're an athlete, you're, <laughs> you're not a normal person. Right. Normal people are doing it in college. You know what I mean? Like, having a good time, making mistakes, learning. You know what I mean? Figuring out things about yourself, finding out what your limits are. You don't know what your limit is until you go past it. You know what yeah. I mean? And so... And if you go past your limit and you're a Heisman quarterback and people are videotaping you, I mean, it, it's not going to be a good look for a lot of people. Right. You know what I mean? And so it's wild, man. And, and having a daughter and, you know, I can't imagine. I, I talk to sh- my wife about this all the time. Shawnee, like, can you imagine what things are going to look like 18 years from now? My daughter's one. So 17, 18 years ago, like the Internet was it was like right after the dot com boom. Right. You know what I mean? Like. Now, where things are at, imagine 18 years from now, like the different, it, 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 I don't even think it's going to look the same. So right. um, it's wild. 
Now you and you said and you said it right, man. It, it, <clears throat> I tell people all the time, you know, with the with the think first motto and stuff like that. It's like it's a it's a natural thing, you know. You think you should know, but a lot of people don't think about the reactions down the line. They think about just now, like whether like if I'm out having fun and I'm tipsy, I'm thinking about having fun right now. I'm thinking about I think about everything else later instead of thinking about the magnitude of you know the choices I make right now. How could it affect my draft uh, status or you know, my business or my job, you know what I mean? We ain't think about it at the moment. We're just thinking about the fun, you know, whereas now yeah. like, I kind of focus, I kind of teach these kids. It sucks because they're young, have fun, but at the same time, you got to have fun, but not too much fun. I like guess you have to put caps on everything because of social media. You can't go out and have fun. You can't be like everybody else. You can't experience college life because everybody's recording. Yeah. Everybody's recording. Everybody's watching you. You're on a, magnif you're on a magnifying glass. And it's, it sucks, man, but, I mean, it is what it is. It is what it is now. So it's it like, is what it gotta, is, right? You got to adjust. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, man, I mean, like you said, man, it's, I tell people all the time, there's no point in looking back in the past unless you're grabbing learning lessons from it. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's yeah. done with. <laughs> you know, we can't go back and relive our college lives and try to do it all over again. So it is what it is on that. Um, so now you have a, a great college career, man, and then – now it's time for the next level. Now it's time to get ready for the draft and, you know, the NBA process. Uh, so what was that experience like for you and the uh, process of that? At first, it was disappointing. I mean, I, I, I expected to get drafted uh, out of college. Um, you know, I felt like when I looked at the pool of players and the 60 guys, I felt like I, I, I was good enough to be one of those guys. But again, one of the things, one of the many, many lessons that I've learned and carried throughout my career in college is the importance of winning, you know, and that's the one thing of all the things, the off the court stuff, man, I really don't regret anything. You know what I mean? I don't regret anything on the court. Um, I would say the number one regret I have is the it's not even a, re I just didn't have the understanding of, of how important that winning element is. Of course, winning is important. Everybody wants to win, but you have so many people that convince you that your individual, that your individual play is a big part of it, which it is to a certain extent. Right. But being concerned about that is doing yourself a disservice as a player, making everything about winning. These guys in college, these, these NBA scouts, man, they know what they're doing. Right. You know, and they know what you can do, whether you average 15 points or whether you average nine points. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have the skill set and, and you go far enough and you win, you open up a lot of doors. So I feel like the fact that we didn't go to the NCAA, NCAA tournament our junior and senior year, I didn't realize that it was over. That was it. There was no, I mean, there was nothing else that, that, that when it came down to me and the other, whoever the other guy was for a couple of teams that considered it, that was the red flag. Because the minute that, that a, a, a program like University of Maryland doesn't go to the tournament, it raises a red flag. So people are going to dig and they're going to say, why didn't that team go to the tournament? There had to have been something going on because they had these talented players. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they did their digging. And there was stuff that I had going on off the court that, that you know, would have been a red flag to, to a certain extent. When I look back on it, you know, with some of the decisions and some of the things that I had happen off the court, mm -hmm. um, you know, where if it's between this guy and that guy, you know, they didn't go. So I think that that was part of it. And so what, to answer your question, I was disappointed at first that I didn't get drafted. Right. And then um, I went to summer league with the Pistons and I broke my foot. So I broke my foot in an area where I was out eight months. It was an avicular joint. So it was a, an injury that take a, took a really long time to heal. So I was out all the way until March 1st of the next year. So I basically missed my whole first year out of college. And that was very, very, very difficult. Not only did I have the setback of not being drafted, right. I had the setback of not even playing and now having to open up the doors to going overseas and then ending up in a small town of a thousand people in Germany, which it was the first division in Germany. And so that was a good start. And we ended up going to the final. Um, and it was a cool experience. And then I did the summer league thing for a couple of years mm. trying to get back. Mm. But, you know, it, it, you know, when I look back at it now, I mean, I, I, what I know now from what I knew then, I understand 
the reason why I wasn't in the NBA. You know, with my size, with my position, there wasn't really a stretch for at that time. I had, I was, am I a three? Am I a wing? And it was, you know, is he laterally quick enough to be blah, 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 blah. But really what it came down to, if I'm not shooting at a 40% clip from three, I'm not going it, to, it, it's just not going to work out. You know, I didn't fit the mold of, you know, a guy who was going to fit on a roster spot um, for my size and position. So if I, it, you know, I was really, I was really beating a, a door that was locked shut. And then I realized that, you know, at a pretty early age, like 22, 23, and then my career started overseas. So it started with a little bit of disappointment, but I carried that chip on my shoulder, um, you know, for the first couple of years and, and worked really hard to get back um, from the injury I had. Right. Uh, and like you said, man, um, yeah, man, I can just, I can only imagine, like you said, man, not getting drafted and then playing somebody thinking you're going to have the opportunity, then you break your foot. Like, I can just only imagine mentally, man, what that must have been like. And then, like you said, you had to set up your whole, pretty much your whole rookie year, you know what I mean? And then now you got to come back and kind of fight your way back and, and, and get rehab. Rehab sucks all within itself. And then try to get back and, and put yourself in position to get an opportunity, whether it's in the NBA or overseas, you know, because they look at all this stuff, you know. But we, you were still fairly young, man, so it was that helped a lot too, you know. And not having a job. I mean, you know, like I finished college and was jobless. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. and it's not like I got out of college and it was like I was using my degree to work somewhere. I didn't have a guaranteed contract. Right. You know, so I'm 22 years old, jobless for a year, right. you know, and that was, that was a, a reality check in terms of like, I don't have my per diem now, you know what I mean? And uh, what are we going to do here? Right. You know, right. so it was like my dukes and them helping me get like a little credit card and maxing as many out as I possibly could. And, Right. That also added to like, I remember I used to videotape myself every once in a while, like to remember where my headspace was at mm -hmm. because I had vision that I was going to get through this. I was going to end up making money, whether it was in the NBA or, you know, overseas. And I wanted to always remember what I felt like at that time, you know, uh, of being, having no job and, and, you know, cause you're still trying to carry yourself. Like I'm a, you know, I was at Maryland. I'm going to be playing pro. So amongst your peers, you're still trying to carry yourself like you're not broke. You right. know what I mean? So I, I you're know. still trying to like, you're still <laughs> trying to like keep up with the Joneses and, and make right. it work. So that whole process uh, and, and how I felt at that time was a huge tailwind then for me, mm -hmm. not only with my basketball career, but with things off the court financially, right. like really, really understanding that I never wanted to feel that way again. And I never wanted to be in that situation again. Um, and having that like reality check for that one year was a, was a, was a great lesson for me because it, 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 you know, it definitely, as I, as I came into making money, I appreciated it that much more. Right. And then, you know, over time it, uh, it definitely served as a major, major motivator for me. Right. And like you said, man, it's the learning lessons, bro. We, we, it sucks when we go through them. It sucks, man. At the time, yeah. now that your, your thought process is a lot different. And now you appreciate the money aspect. You felt, you know what it felt like. Cause like you said, in college, we had to, we, man, we chartered jets, uh, escorted to, on the bus to the, to the yeah. airports for dams. I mean, we didn't food. I mean, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't want for anything. You know what I mean? Then yeah. like you said, you can go from that to, now I don't have that. I don't have the access anymore. You know what I mean? We don't have. We're not yeah. getting. Um, we don't have those people there to help us like at Maryland, where we had people doing this, that, and the third for us. You know, helping us out. Right. Um. <clears throat> so now you go to overseas, right? What was some of your best experiences over there in regards to what country you were in, and what was the not so great ones? So I was fortunate after that first year in Germany to play well in summer league. And um, then I went, I decided I played well with Sacramento and went to, to training camp with them. Um, felt like I had some traction there. Um, and, and again, you know, sometimes when I break this shit down, it, it, it ends up sounding like a, like a pity party with the injury shit. Cause then I go to training camp with Sacramento and 
I, I damaged a ligament on the outside of my knee. So I was out for like two months. So I, I had to leave training camp and then I had to go back home again. Like, again, I went, I had a job for two, three months, which got me back to where I needed to be with some of the, you know, you know, kind of debt I had for that first year out. And then I decided to go to the to training camp. And then I, I ended up having to leave due to an injury and played well and in, 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 in thought I had a pretty good shot at making that team and ended up back home in Maryland. I was staying in Maryland and doing my, my, uh, my rehab there. And fortunately I was convinced to go the D league route, which I didn't want to do, but it was like, look, you don't really have anything great overseas right now. Right. And I still really wanted to be in the league because I felt like I was so close. Yeah. So I go to the, I enter the draft for the D league. I get drafted and I go to Sioux Falls and Nate Tibbetts was the coach there. He's the head assistant for the trailblazers now. And he was awesome. And I had some really big games, like the first two months I was there. Yeah. And then I got an offer and Bartle see my agent is like, you're going to be one of the first call ups. Like you, you, I'm getting some calls, you know? And so I felt like there was traction, but then boom, I get offered a job in the ACB for Grand Canaria, which is like on the beach. Right. And it was for like 20 grand a month. Right. And I was just like, so to me again, 20 grand a month, I'm like sold. Right. I'm, I'm in South Dakota right. in like the negative 10 degrees and two feet of snow staying in like a efficiency with Jason right. Klotz, this wild ass dude from, 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 from Texas. Oh, okay. and uh yeah from texas and i'm like i'm out and i go there and i and i went i went to the to the acb which i didn't know how incredible an opportunity that was like a lot of guys play their whole career to get that acb shot mm -hmm. and i got it due to situation and a, and a timing thing i got that opportunity and went there and played well and then ended up staying there in spain for a few years and that was the that was the that was like the the trajectory and the platform. And I, and a lot of young guys, it's, 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 an, it's crazy how fragile that first year or two is in, in Europe. You mm -hmm. don't even, it, it is the most make or break mm -hmm. right place, right time. If you don't have the right numbers on the right team with the right minutes in the right league, you can go from here to here. I mean, it's, it's insane. Yeah. You don't real, it's like, okay, there's a thousand different leagues. Right. But there's only a few where like you don't live in like a very, very difficult situation with like a crazy schedule, awful travel for not really that much money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I realized it at that time. And because I think of some of the things that have happened at first, I really appreciated it. And I didn't take it for granted that some Americans do coming from big schools like I'm um, so and so from so and so school like that shit doesn't fly in Europe. Right. You are just another American who they expect to be a selfish prick. Right. A lot of these guys, they like to, to be honest, like they have seen so many guys come over there with that attitude and that mentality. Like I'm here to get mine and get money and move on up and That's get out of my way, you right. know? And so I was able to kind of fit in and figure out my way with dealing with that stuff pretty early. Cause I was so grateful to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so just that, that, negative experience came to fruition for me relatively quick of just being super grateful to even have that opportunity. And I was able, and, and, and I was still so motivated because I felt a, I felt like at that time in my twenties that I was good enough to be in the NBA and B now that I'm here in Europe, I'm seeing a lot of guys that I'm better than. And in my position, I want to be one of the top players in Europe in my position. And that was my goal. And I used, Obviously, the money side, being as it's a business, I, that to me was the scoreboard from a certain extent. Like, I see this guy making a million dollars. I'm getting it. There's no way I'm not. I'm going to figure out what I need to do to do it. I studied what I needed to do, where I needed to go. I was really hands on with like what teams I went to and what my role was going to be in the minutes and mm -hmm. what the coach's system was and all these different things. And I, it, I got a little bit of, of momentum and, you know, right place, right time, had a, a couple winning teams and then got with the right agent. And then when I was about 27, I had a really good year in, in Spain. And then after that, I started to make, you know, some, some really good money for a few years. And that started to give me some, some real good trajectory um, 
for the next years after that. Right. <clears throat> and like you said, man, you, you said something very key. And that was in the sense of that was in the sense of the first that, that, that first year, that first that first year, um, that first year overseas is, is so critical and so important that um, if you pick the wrong if you pick the wrong situation, that can that can because how do you look at it? You look at they look at your resume and they look at, oh, well, you play here. It, it can affect either your money or it can affect um, the respect factor. Like I was in. I remember going, being to South Korea and I was making about 25 a, a, a month over there. And I'm like, cool. So when it was time for me to leave there, I'm telling my agent, like, yo, and I had an offer to go to Spain. I tell my agent, I'm like, oh, man, I need the same amount over in, in Europe. He's like, but they don't they don't respect the Asian market like that. They don't. Not so it's like all. the competition yeah. is good. So it's like, but I'm young. I don't, I don't know. This is my first year over, like my first official year overseas. <clears throat> so I didn't understand that. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't, like you said, you're a young player, you don't know these things. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's, 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 it's key. We, I, like I remember looking at uh, Drew Nicholas and his acceleration in this pro career in regards to, I know his first year, what he made and he played in France. And then from there, it was like a, a building factor. You know what I mean? So, but I, like, like I said, me, man, when I was overseas, I didn't look at those things. If I wasn't happy, I was out. You know what I mean? But yeah. they look at that stuff too. They, they look at for sure. You know, why you keep bouncing from place to place? So that affects your money. It affects what team want to pick you up. Your the leagues you play in. <clears throat> like people, every place I went, people always question like, like why are you here or right? Because I didn't understand. They look at your resume. I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't understand those things. Like you said, what you understand now and what you learned early on in your career, which helped you get to to, to where you're at now in your 15 career, 15 seasons. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think Absolutely. a lot of I think a lot of the young guys definitely need to know that and hear those things because the poor, especially now, man, because the the money's overseas is different now with the pandemic and the way things is. It's not like how what like how it used to be. You know what I mean? So, man, it's it's uh it's, it's it's man. I don't know. It's like you said, it's a blessing, bro. To just man, you did 15 seasons, bro. That's that's a that's a long time, man. That's that's a long I appreciate time. Appreciate it. What, what, so what, what was, okay, so you had some of your best. What was some of the moments that was like, and I think I remember one country you were in, man, and it was like, I was like, bro, where you at? And you told me, I was like, I, I, I can, and it was so cold over there. I remember you telling me that. And I, I think you still was making pretty good money. So what was, so you in a place where it may not be as great as the south of France or, you know, Grand Canary, but you're still making good money. So what was that like? You know, you can make good money, but you it's not as great as the other countries you probably were in. Yeah, I mean, that was... So I left... I was in Malaga in the EuroLeague, and then I went to Kazakhstan. And, uh, you know, Kazakhstan was a, was a, one of the coldest places in the world, but that was 100%. I was 100% about the money. You know, it was, a, it was a really... It was the biggest contract I've gotten in my career. Um, and so that was, you know, it made everything about it that was brutal from the long, long trips to the cold, one of the, it's the coldest capital city in the world. Um, it made that part easy. You know what I mean? It made that part like I can handle this because every time that the check hit each month, I'm like, listen, I, you can, you can bury me under the ground. You can put me in jail <laughs> for this and, and I'm good. Like right. I, I literally like, for that type of money because i really appreciate and respect money you know right. what i mean and so like i don't take it for granted you know right. um so i literally used to joke like you you could put me in jail for 10 months for this amount of money i will do 10 months in jail for this <laughs> amount of money and if you don't believe me offer me that amount of money and i'll go to jail <laughs> for sure <laughs> so and i understand people are probably like well i can tell you've never been to jail i know some <laughs> Some of my closest friends who have unfortunately had to go that route. Um, people that I've, I've known since I was really young and I could handle it for 10 months for that amount of money. I mean, it was just that, that point in my career was a move that was because of money. the money, you know? And, but when I was in Germany, when I first got over there and it was 2000 people, uh, you know, in that town and I just missed my whole first year out there was a lot of times where I questioned if I want to do this. A lot of conversations 
with my dad where I'm like, I'm not, I'm done. I'm coming home. I'm, I can't do this. Like, there's no way I can. And, you know, thank God that I had his guidance to, to talk me and walk me through it. You know, um, it's really important to have somebody in your life who can talk you off the ledge. You know what I mean? Because I, I, of everybody I know who's gone to Europe, I don't know one guy who hasn't wanted to leave at some point. Like, I, I can't do this. You know what I mean? You're by yourself. You know, it doesn't matter even if you're in Madrid, Spain, places that sound awesome to people. Right. Like, okay, it's nice if you're on a vacation for a week, but if you're all by, if you're by yourself and you're doing two a days and you're traveling, it's not, it's hard work. You know what right. I mean? Like, I don't want to sound like, you know, it's, you know, it's not the best job in the world because it is, but right. make no mistake about it, it. It's work. You know what I mean? And so, and you're away from your family and, and, you know, so it, it's one of these things where, um, there was a lot of times that, that I remember over the last 15 years where, I mean, I don't know of a year that I've had overseas where there hasn't been one point, even from being 37, 36, 35, 34, all the way down to 22, where I haven't been like, I, I don't think this is going to work out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's never a perfect year. You know what I mean? There's always adversity and there's always times where you're just like, oh, man. You know, even when you're on the French Riviera, like that's the way it is. Like the grass is always greener. I, I, you know, when I talk to young kids, at least about my experience, it, you know, money doesn't solve everything. You know right. what I mean? And mental health and being happy, that to me is the, the success that I'm chasing, you know, right. and to me, money is a vehicle that I've worked for to try to take a path of less resistance, obviously. Right with certain things I don't have to deal with, hopefully. Right. But there's always going to be adversity and shit where, you know, it's rough, it's tough. Like you have a bad day, you're stressed out, you're depressed about X, Y, and Z. Right. And that sol solidarity of being overseas, you know, that's the best part of, I've been with my wife now for five years, been married for a couple of years. And, and um, you know, that to me obviously changed everything because having her with me has made the process it, it's a lot better than, you know, because being, being by yourself can wear on you. And a lot of guys can't handle that. Now, you're absolutely right, man. And, and you said you said a lot of key points in the sense of, you know, people that mental health when you're over there, man. If you don't have your family with you, you're going through certain things. I remember, I think I saw you, we, I saw you, we was over in Lithuania together. We, and we, yeah, we, we, that was yeah. great when we like, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 um, and I remember we were talking in your room, bro, and you was talking about this, this, this is gonna be probably my last year right here. I said, I said, oh, man. He was like, yeah, man. You was like, you was icing your knees, like, yeah, man, my knees, man. I can't, you know, can't do it, man. Like, man, I this, this, I might, I'm shutting it down after this year. And you sound like a two year deal or something, or like another one year. I said, Look at this dude, man. He told me he's retiring, and then you. That, that, was, was, that was five years ago. Exactly, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yo. I've said that every year for the last five years. <laughs> I was saying, man, you say shut down. Next, you know, I think I was talking to somebody. I said, man, he just signed over. He signed over in, um, I think after you left Kazakhstan, you signed back over. And where was you? Went, where did you go? France? After uh, after Kazakhstan, I went to Monaco. I said, this dude, I said, this dude right here told me he's retiring. Yeah. Man. <laughs> but here's the thing, bro. But no, because to your point, I said that. I've said that every year for the past five, but it, for me, it was a psychological mind game. I would, I would play with myself okay, because it would take pressure off me. Like yeah. I put so much pressure on myself throughout my career. Like in looking back at it, like every game to me was life or death. Right. You know what I mean? Like I put so much pressure. I didn't really enjoy the games because I had so much anxiety that I had to have a great game. We had to win. Or when you have a week in between that week would be just devastating. Yeah. If you lose in a bad game, that long week of practice, mm -hmm. it was the worst. And I would fear that week of, of sitting on a loss. So I would just put so much pressure on myself and, and it helped me be successful for sure. But in Europe, you're not on these, you mentioned a two year deal. That was like a 10 year deal in, in the NBA. Like it's one year, one year, you have no room for error. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when you're at the highest level, I wanted to stay at that level. You know what right. I mean? I, I didn't want, to take a, a step back. So, you know, I would then get to the point where it's like, you know what, this is my last year because I, I you know, there's other things in life I can do. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I started doing things off the court with investing and, and with some business development stuff when I was 27. So about 10 years ago now, 
So at that point, I had five years of traction with that stuff. Right. Um, and so that made me see what life would look like off the court. And I knew I was going to be good. Right. So I was going to be able to leave the game and be able to provide for my family. Right. So it, t- it was like I took it. I did basically long story short. I told myself that and I put that energy out there just mm-hmm. to take some damn pressure off myself. Like, you right. know what I mean? This is it's OK if, if this is the last year. You know what I mean? Right. To prepare myself for that. And now five years later, I'm telling you the same thing. Is this going to be my last year? My, this is it, bro. <laughs> it sounds, it up. Hey, I feel you on that now. T- 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 real quick before I let you go. T- tell me about, because I know you're doing some stuff up in Maine, man. I know you said the nonprofit, and I know you're doing something. Tell me what you're doing business-wise off the court, man. Tell us. Yeah, yeah I've... Uh, I've I mentioned when I was 27, my, <clears throat> I wanted to be really proactive when I started to make money. That was something I was committed to pretty, pretty early. Um, and so I was really, really pro because, you know, being overseas, you have a lot of free time. Right. I'm not a video. I'm not a video game guy. Uh, it got to the point where I wasn't going out because I really un- I learned to diet and the process stuff. So I was really taking care of my body. Um, so I had all this free time. So I started to really study. I started with real estate with just some small, um, you know, mixed unit, uh, type stuff, mixed use, commercial, residential. And I just took step by step for a couple of years of investing in some stuff in Maine. And then I started to do the renovation work. I built a team of guys through meeting a couple, um, carpenters and then some sub contractors and then so i i partnered with a a a carpenter and we started a a small real estate development company that i was really active for about five years with that and through that process i developed a space um which is popular now it's a a shared like a co-working space Mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a like a social engagement slash co-working so there's event space private offices uh, and I started that business myself and then brought in a team of management. And I just found a passion for that because a lot of the same principles with sports, with the team and bringing the right personalities together and putting that time and passion I was using on the court, right. it gave me that off the court. So I was just studying business leaders, different models. And there's so much online that you can, that you can access now um, mm-hmm. that I just dove into it. And so I started a business called Cloudport in right. Portland, Maine. Um, and that was now about five, it'll be five years this year. Um, and then, so I, then I started with investing. I've invested in a couple different industries in Maine. Um, and I, I, one that I'm really excited about is the marijuana industry, which is, is, is a booming industry in the United States and throughout the world. But Maine's been ahead of that for a while because Maine's been medicinally legal for a while and recreationally legal for a while. Um, so I partnered with, with somebody, uh, four years ago in that industry, uh, and that's gone well and, uh, you know, continue to do some investing in, in the markets, like really, um, not anything crazy, like long-term stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's it. So I've just been really active off the court with, with entrepreneurial stuff and, and finding different things I'm passionate about. And, you know, so now it's like, I love to play basketball. Right. And I'm going to play as long as I can, but I know what things are going to look like when I'm done for sure. Like I'm going to transition out into what I already have in motion and continuing to build relationships and trying to find things that I, that I love doing. And one of them, which is like part of what we've talked about this whole conversation is helping young players with the process we just talked about from when mm-hmm. you leave college and how do you manage your, your trajectory as a, as a, as a player in Europe? you know, especially an American and how things have changed and being here for 15 years, I understand that I have a resume and an an experience and skill set where I understand some of the things you need to do for that trajectory. So uh, that's something that I've already started to do helping guys and connecting them with the right representation for for that path. And uh, so that's something I'm going to keep doing too. Okay, man. Yeah, man. That's that's awesome, man. I, obviously, I keep up with everything you're doing, man. With playing over likewise, season, man, and business wise, man. So I'm definitely super <laughs> proud, definitely super proud of you, bro, and everything that you're doing, everything that you got going on. 
Um, I appreciate your brotherhood, man. All the fun times we had back in college, yeah. pops, but we also still t- stay close. You know, all of us, me, you, John, all of us, honestly. Um, and man, everything that you're doing, man, with the family, you know, the, the you wiped up now, man, got the little one, man. That's a blessing, man. Um, Likewise, so man. I mean, we can inspire each other from afar, man. And, and, and I don't mean to cut you off, but just before we head out, man, I wanted to tell you how much I appreciate and respect you as a father and the stuff you've done. I mean, an author, you know, the books that you published in the, in the think first, uh, what you're bringing to young, young players. We needed it. Players need it. People need it. And, you know, it inspires me to see the stuff you've been doing, man. And, and I look forward to us being able to connect off the court. That's been one of the biggest things being in Europe for 15 years. One of the biggest things that, that, it, that I have to sacrifice is, the relationships face to face. I mean, like people were freaking out about doing zoom calls. I'm like, I've been doing video calls for 10 years. Like it's going to be all right, people. We're going to be, be I mean, it's not ideal, but this is, you know, this is what, what I've had to do for, you know, a long time and not being able to have those relationships. And so I can't wait to get back and link. And, uh, you know, it's been great. I appreciate you having me, having me on, man. I was excited about it and, you know, look forward to connecting soon, bro. Yeah, absolutely, man. Anything you need from me, bro, and everything that you're doing, man, I'm all for it. Um, you know, and I'm definitely going to reach out to you to help me doing what I'm doing, man. I'm still building up on things, man, and trying to spread the word and the message, man. And you definitely have that Please experience. Do. Been there, done that, man. So I'm definitely going to be reaching out to you, man, for sure. Um, but nah, definitely good luck to the rest of your season for the, to the rest of your season, bro. You might end up pulling the twenty, knowing you. Because of LeBron yeah, James taking up in you. <laughs> uh, this is it, man. This is the last year, bro. This is it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, nah, man, nah, seriously, bro, I appreciate you uh, taking time out your, your schedule, man, your day, man. Tell the family I said hello. Thanks for joining Go Terps with Travis Garrison. Go Terps, man. Absolutely, bro. <laughs> Absolutely, bro. I'll talk to you later. I appreciate you, bro.